Well, again, I greet um, all of the parishioners and all of you who are gathered here. Um, I already introduced our seminarians early, but I just want you to know they've been a great help to me. And there's actually seven of us living in the rectory right now. We have four priests and three seminarians, and it's um, a delight to have them with us. And maybe in a future Mass, we'll also bring in one of our musicians and and uh, have you know some accompaniment and so on. So all of these are just ways of saying um, this is something we're beginning to try. I'm grateful to Gershon Peaks, who's our cameraman, and we're here. And uh, it's uh, it's bittersweet, you know, to look at a largely empty church. But I imagine you all here, and I'm grateful. Today is Divine Mercy Sunday, and gosh, I, I, so much comes through my mind. Um, I was originally scheduled to preach uh, at the Basilica of this day. Uh, of course, that's all been canceled too, but but here I am, and I, I would speak to you about divine mercy. I want to call this, title this message, Perfect Mercy, Perfect Mercy, on this Divine Mercy Sunday. I'm going to look at it in four parts. There's the prelude to mercy, there's the peace of mercy, the priesthood of mercy, and the prerequisite of mercy. So, with all that in mind, Let's just get started with this. You know, I I think, first of all, there's several errors that um, we need to disabuse ourselves of when it comes to mercy. A lot of people today mistake mercy for acceptance or approval, so that um, mercy means that God is, like, really cool with everything I'm doing, you know. That's, (laughs) That's mercy to them. And, of course, if that were the case, we wouldn't need mercy, right? We need mercy because God is not cool (laughs) with everything we're doing. We're sinners and we need his mercy. And thanks be to God, he offers it to us in abundance. And this is what we celebrate this day. But, you know, you've got to understand that that his mercy doesn't mean everything is just, he's just happy and, uh, and, quote, cool with everything we're doing. It's just the opposite. But because he loves us, he extends to us a time of mercy and of grace so that we can grow in holiness and be ready to see him one day. So again, I just want to first of all mean mercy doesn't mean that there's no judgment. Mercy exists because there is a day of judgment. And God now has given us this time of grace and mercy to get us ready, to get us ready for the great judgment day that we all face. So now is the time to call on God's mercy. Now is the time to say, Lord, I know I need your mercy, and, but brothers and sisters, whatever you're di- struggling with in your life, I beg you, I beg you, as I beg myself, do not go on calling good or no big deal what God calls sin. It's no way to be saved, and in a way we cancel mercy when we talk like that. There's really only one sin that God can't forgive, and it's that clenched fist that says, I will not be told what to do. I will do as I please, and I will decide whether it's right and wrong. Oh, no, no, don't be that way. God is offering mercy now. He says, everything is not right in your life. There are sins, there are excesses, there are omissions. And for all of us to realize what a beautiful gift it is to be able to fall to our knees and just say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And to know, Jesus says, no one who calls on me will I ever reject. So, what a beautiful then day to reflect on mercy as we look at this gospel. So notice again the prelude of mercy. You'll notice that as the scene opens in this gospel that the apostles and others are gathered in the upper room and they're gathered in fear and the doors are locked. They're afraid that of the of the Jewish authorities and but they're also more than that these are broken, troubled, disturbed men and women or in this case, men, it was just the apostles here. They deserted the Lord. Only John had made it to the foot of the cross. And they're broken. The, the one they thought was their leader, who was so strong, so powerful, had raised people from the dead, was tortured to death. And they weren't there for him. And so again, this is the prelude to mercy, this, this sense of brokenness, of trouble, that they let the Lord down, that they weren't there for him. So that's the prelude. But you know, there's, a, there's an old saying that if you don't know the bad news, the good news is no news. And that's why we need to look for a moment at just, just what a tragic and sad scene this is. But that's important because it shows us then the beauty of what's about to unfold. And again, before we go on and see the story, I would say that in our times, 
People struggle with mercy for many reasons. I think, again, one of the great errors of our day is that we preach mercy without any reference to repentance. But you see, it's repentance that unlocks mercy. It's that repentance. I mentioned that earlier. But I would say there's kind of three groups in our world today who in some way exemplify this brokenness and this alienation that these men were experiencing. On the one hand, we're living in rebellious times in which many are just dismissive of sin. And they've refashioned God into just some kind of doting grandfather who just happens to agree with everything they think. And so you've got this, this one group uh, who, who sees no real need for mercy and, and uh, that, that, uh, that God, God doesn't really care what they're doing. There's another, on the other hand, though, there are a lot of times people in our times who are scared and angry with God. They're rejecting his judgments or his glorious moral vision. Or maybe a tragedy's happened in their life that they don't understand. And so again, they're, they're, they're scared or they're angry with God and they're at a distance from him. They feel alienated from him. But most of all, many are confused and angry because they don't know forgiveness. We live in such unforgiving times. I mean, think of some of the things that go on on both sides of the political aisle. Some politician 30 years ago, 40 years ago, did a foolish thing and, and he must be destroyed or she must be destroyed for it. And so many others, there's no forgiveness. It's all sudden death. There's so little forgiveness in our culture today. And there's you know, a kind of a political correctness or a, an insistence, a kind of a very selective moral outrage. And if it is transgressed, there is no mercy. They must completely be destroyed and disappear from the scene forever. Forever. And this is common in our culture today. And all these things push mercy to the limits and, and so on. But let's go back. See, that's the bad news in our culture. Some of us are frightened. Some of us are angry. Some of us are disappointed. Some of them were disappointed in Jesus in that upper room. I thought He was going to triumph and win the victory for us and bring in the kingdom of David and He died. All of this is going on in their minds and all of this goes on in our culture. And so we see though for the prelude to mercy is the bad news. (laughs) Broken, angry, disappointed, humbled men. Unaware. Not being able to forgive themselves. Not knowing what to do. Alienated. But into this now, into this will step Jesus. Into this will step Jesus. Here comes this beautiful, beautiful moment. It says, at this very moment, Jesus came and He stood in their midst and He said to them, Peace be with you. And when He had said this, He showed them His hands and His side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. You know, look at the mercy of this. Think of it. The Lord could have said, Where were you when I needed you? <laughs> yeah, I, told you I told you I'd rise on the third day. Where's your faith? You know, he could have done any, any number of things. He stands before them and he says, Peace. Shalom. Now, you know, we need to capture this word peace recapture it. Peace, it often means in modern American culture that we're not killing each other, we're not yelling at each other. That that is the absence of conflict. But in in, in Hebrew and, and also in Greek, it's a much richer concept. Shalom means the presence and the relationship of everything that should be there. The Greek word's very interesting, Irene. If we get the, the name Irene, means peace. It's from the Greek root eru, which, eru, which means together or whole. In other words, everything is present in the relationship that should be there. Love, respect, reciprocity, a sense of joy in the presence of the other. That's, that's shalom. And see, the Lord says, shalom, shalom. Now, he didn't, this is the first time he ever said this. He never said this before he died and rose. Because there was no peace. But now... He's opened the way to the Father. He's opened the way to the heart of the Father. And He can say to them now, there is shalom, shalom. What a beautiful, glorious moment. The text says that they rejoiced. But again, um, the, um, 
again, we, in, the Greek word is, is, is so much richer. It, it doesn't just mean to, you know, chorkle for a minute and have a, have a laugh. It means to have a deep, serene, confident joy, a stable joy. Something comes upon them that's deep and rich. A sense again, they rejoiced. They had this deep, deep joy that came to their heart. And so you see what a magnificent, what a magnificent moment this is. Now, I want to just say a word, too, because it is Divine Mercy Sunday. I want to read from the diary of Sister Faustina. And Sister Faustina has, says something quite remarkable about herself. And imagine, the Lord is speaking to her, and he's talking to an, a cloistered nun. And listen to what he says to her. He says, you see what you are of yourself, but don't be frightened at this. If I were ever to reveal to you the whole misery that you are, you would die of terror. <laughs> but because you are in a, such a great misery, I have revealed to you the whole ocean of my mercy. Imagine, he's talking to a cloistered nun. What would he say to someone like me? <laughs> Someone like, like you all, I mean, out in the world. I mean, if, if I were to ever to reveal to you the whole misery that you are, you would die of fright. But because, because of this misery, the ocean of my mercy is available to you. You see, again, these frightened, terrified men, the misery that they were, and they were in touch with it. But now the flood of mercy comes upon them. And so he also writes in the diary, uh, she writes in the diary, Jesus says this to her, My love and my mercy for you know no bounds. The graces I grant are not for you alone, but for a great number of other souls as well. And the greater the sinner, the greater the right he has to my mercy. Did you hear that? That's strong language. He has a right to my mercy. The sinner has a right to my mercy. How often... We fail to tell this today. People only hear scolding. Do they hear forgiveness? Do they hear mercy? That's what these men experienced. Frightened men, that prelude, gives way to the beautiful peace of mercy that comes upon them. And is this what we offer as a church? Sometimes I'm afraid that we're known more for what we're against than what we're for. But again, we have to talk about the bad news. If you don't know the bad news, the good news is no news. We have to get in touch with the whole misery that we are. But that's when the good news really explodes. <gasps> and this ocean of mercy is available to me, see. And somehow we have to get that message out too. Now then, there comes the peace. We talked about the peace of mercy. Next there is, if you will, um, there's a, a, a priesthood of mercy. And I won't develop it too much here. I preached it in other times. But he, he then breathed on them and he said, Look, he says, the Father has sent me, so now I send you. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. Now here's the magnificence of this. He's giving these first priests the authority to forgive sin, in some cases to retain it. It's not just announcing mercy, but there's a kind of a juridical power. They have to hear a case, make a decision if there's sufficient contrition, and then grant mercy. And more often than not, we can do that. But this is a power given. And we as Catholics have an obligation to seek the Lord's mercy, particularly for more serious sins in this way. Jesus Christ is establishing it here that there's a special power given to the priest of the church to utter and proclaim God's mercy to the sinner. And you know, I can only say as a sinner myself, I try to get to confession once a week, that there's just something powerful about hearing those words from a priest. I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You see, the Lord didn't want His mercy to simply depend on some self-generated notion that I feel forgiven. But those words uttered by the priest, which is really Jesus speaking, I absolve you from your sins. So you see, the priesthood of mercy, the Lord says, I don't want my mercy to be some vague feeling that you feel as it comes upon you. I want there to be an objective reality that you can experience about it. All right, finally then we come to the last point, the prerequisite of mercy. You notice that St. Thomas was missing that first night. We don't know why. 
Was he more discouraged than the others? Had he fallen into despair? We don't know. But thanks be to God, the community went and reached out to him and said, come on, you've got to join us. We've seen the Lord. And he doubted them. But to his credit, he did join with them the following Sunday. He joined with them. And again, look at the mercy of the Lord for him. He says, Thomas, Thomas, if you need to have all this evidence here, here, I'm going to give it to you. But Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. But he gives a great mercy to him. He says, Shalom. Shalom. Thomas, too, then receives this beautiful, beautiful gift of mercy. And yes, he receives a mild rebuke from the Lord that he didn't believe the proclamation of the church. But he just receives this beautiful mercy, Thomas. Shalom. Shalom, Thomas. Peace be with you. Well, church, you know, and um, some of you who are regular parishioners here, you know how I love to end with a song. And I want you to know that regarding Thomas, on this, beautiful, this, on this beautiful day of Divine Mercy Sunday, where we celebrate the great, great mercy of God and we look at this gospel, Thomas was the last one of the apostles to experience this mercy. But he experienced it, and he's so glad he did. And I have it on the best of authority that he was singing a gospel song. He says, I almost let go. I felt like I just couldn't take life anymore. My problems had me bound. Depression weighed me down. But God held me close so I wouldn't let go. Oh, God's mercy kept me so I wouldn't let go. Yes, I almost gave up. I was right at the edge of a breakthrough but couldn't see it. Oh, the devil really had me. But Jesus came and grabbed me and he held me close so I wouldn't let go. God's mercy kept me so I wouldn't let go. He says, so I'm here today because God kept me. God kept me so I wouldn't let go. God's perfect mercy, divine healing, calling, converting, and soul-saving mercy. Yes, God's perfect mercy. Amen. Well, let's say the creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate to the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified in a Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, and who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's pray, first of all, for our own sense of experiencing God's mercy. And uh, that having experienced it and received it deeply, that we um, will be able to share mercy with others. We pray to the Lord. Lord we pray for family, friends, and loved ones, especially some of those who may be among those who are either alienated uh, from God from some way or angry with Him, or perhaps just dismissive of sin and not, not aware of their need for mercy. Lord, work something in their heart to help them to appreciate their beautiful need for mercy, and then, having received it, the joy of that mercy. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask and pray also, Lord, for all those who are suffering now in so many ways, especially on account of this plague that we are going through. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick. We pray also for the first responders and those who, in the medical profession, who are on the front line to this battle. We pray also for those who do research. 
We pray for government officials and others. We pray for prudence. We pray for those who are in our own families who have grown ill or who are unemployed or in any way suffering on account of this current difficulty, this current trial, this current crisis. Please bless all who suffer, Lord. Bring them healing, grace, strength, and consolation. We pray to the Lord. For those who have died, Lord, we ask your mercy upon them. Wipe every tear from their eyes and welcome them quickly and fully to the kingdom of God. And for all the particular needs and intentions that all of us have in our hearts just now, Lord, you know these things better than we. We present these intentions to you for, in this holy mass and ask you to answer all of our prayers in the name of Jesus, who is our perfect mercy and our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our speaker this evening attained his Master's of Divinity and Master's of Arts degree in Moral Theology from Mount St. Mary Seminary in 1989. Ordained to the priesthood in that same year, Monsignor Pope has served at several parishes in the Archdiocese of Washington and was named Monsignor in 2005 by Pope Benedict XVI. He has served as pastor at Holy Comforter St. Cyprian Parish in Washington, D.C. since 2007 and blogs regularly for the Archdiocese of Washington, which we highly recommend. If you just Google Monsignor Pope blog, you'll find it. Uh, Monsignor Pope, it's a joy as always to have you with us, and I hand the mic over to you. All right. So do a sound check here. Is it audible? Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, Father Hezekiah has asked me to speak a little bit on uh, today's feast, which is the Feast of Divine Mercy, and um, um, to you know develop it with you a bit. And in a normal time, I would have actually at this time uh, been over at the Basilica uh, in, the, in the pulpit of the, of the uh, Great Upper Church uh, uh, preaching. Uh, I had been scheduled to preach Divine Mercy Sunday um, this year. Every few years they asked me to come and preach it. So this would have been another one of my turns in the rotation. But anyway, here we are. Here we are. Um, I would say to you that... Um, if we look into this topic of divine mercy, I'm, I'm, it's not so much my job today to give you a full history of Sister Faustina and the devotion and so on, but rather to just simply take the feast as it is and to apply it. Let's talk about what mercy is, what it is not. And also, uh, Father Hezekiah asked me to maybe deal with divine mercy and in, in this relationship to the day of judgment. So we'll kind of conclude on that aspect as well. All right. So. I'm going to be quoting from a few books here, of course, from the diary of uh, Sister Faustina. I'll have a couple of quotes. Also, I want to quote from um, a beautiful book. If you've never seen it or read it, um, I think it's uh, A.G. Sertilange's what Jesus, what Jesus Saw from the Cross. Um, it's a beautiful book and a meditation on, on the heart of Jesus, really, as he hung on the cross for us and... Uh, it's, a, it's, again, it's a worthy book. It's a Sophia Press book, and uh, I would encourage you to have that on your shelf for next Lent, if, although we haven't extended Lent <laughs> to some degree this year. Okay, so let's talk about mercy. Um, you know, going back to the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in, into the 1800s, there was a growing concern, it would seem, from heaven that we had uh, pretty well... Um, um, seize the market, if you will, on fear of judgment and, and kind of servile fear. And there was something that Jesus began with uh, Margaret Mary Alacoque and uh, working also through Our Lady to reach out that says, look, the Lord actually really loves you. He's your Savior. He's your Lord. God is your Father. He made you. He created you to be with him. Um, please understand the glory and the beauty of my mercy for you. And so beginning with the Sacred Heart devotion and then beautifully uh, developed here with uh, Sister Faustina's um, development of the Divine Mercy Chapel through her devotions or through her diary, I should say. Remember, and at first, both by Margaret Mary and Sister Faustina were kind of considered kooks, you know, in their own community and by some of their superiors and, uh, and so on. But little by little, this message has taken root among God's people. The message of mercy is essential, but unfortunately, many of us, I think today, not because of them, 
but because of our own excesses and our own cultural situation, have largely misunderstood mercy. So let's let's exclude a couple notions of uh, of mercy that are that we, we is what we don't mean by God's mercy. Unfortunately, today a lot of people presume that mercy, God's mercy, means He is really cool with everything I'm doing. God doesn't care that I live with my girlfriend or that I'm you know, smoking uh, excessively or drinking excessively or greedy or, you know, God doesn't care about any of that. Like you, you dumb priest, or you nasty traditional Christian. Um, God is way cool with everything I'm doing. And that's what God's mercy means to some people. It mean, they equate it with approval. Okay. But you can see, I hope, if, you, if, you're, if you're a good purveyor of logic, that we wouldn't need mercy if that were the case. If God was like really cool with everything I'm doing, we wouldn't need his mercy, you know, because uh, he approves of it. But it's because he does not approve <laughs> of what we are doing to others or to ourselves or this, the harm that both sin causes us and, and causes other people um, because he's not way cool with that, because he, he's concerned for us. Uh, that's why we need mercy. And why mercy is so precious and beautiful and wonderful. Do you understand? This is a time for all of us. This time before we go to our judgment day of grace and mercy and abundance. God just pours forth his love and his mercy for us. Because we're in bad shape. We're in terrible shape. And we don't really even... And, and, and part of his mercy, frankly, is that he preserves us from understanding just how bad our condition actually is, all right? I mean, you know, it's, it's really bad, y'all. Uh, and I'm going to give you some quotes about that. Um, since it is Divine Mercy Sunday, let me start with a, something that he said to Sister Faustina. And this is in her diary. It's in diary number two uh, at number 718, if you have that available. I'm just going to quote it to you. It's just a very brief quote. But listen, now remember, y'all, he is saying this to a woman who's a cloistered religious, all right? It, it, uh, just keep the context in mind. He says this to Sister Faustina. Faustina, you see what you are of yourself, but do not be afraid, frightened at this. But if I were to ever reveal to you the whole misery that you are, you would die of terror. But because you are in such a great misery, <laughs> I have revealed to you the whole ocean of my mercy. Okay, I mean, case closed, y'all. If Sister Faustina, if God can describe her that way, you know, you and I, man, it ain't even, you know, come on, let's get real. We are in worse shape than we imagine, all right? Um, now, this isn't to take, I'm going to kind of rescue this in a minute, but let's stay with this, you know, really powerful image for a minute. Let me give you some biblical images maybe to remember. You remember there was a day when um, the Lord uh, was preaching in Peter's house. And people were standing outside, he's at the doorway, and they, they open up the roof and they lower down a paraplegic. I mean, he, this guy is paralyzed, you know, he's a, I'm sorry, he's probably a quadriplegic, he's paralyzed. And he's lowered down on this mat in front of Jesus, and Jesus says, wow, man, whew, man, your, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> you, uh, you want to tap Jesus on the shoulder for a minute, don't you? Say, I, I'm Jesus. Um, it, it, the problem is that he's, he, he's, he's paralyzed, that's his problem. And Jesus says, man, I, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> no, of course, I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Of course, but you see the point. Jesus looks at a, at a quadriplegic and concludes that his most serious problem is his sin. He, and he goes to work on that first. You see the idea? And later on, a secondary matter is his paralysis. I mean, that's secondary. Now, we don't think like that. And even when we're told to think like that, we still don't think like that. We cannot imagine anything worse than being a quadriplegic, you know? I mean, it's just, you know. Now, another example, he uses this example a lot in his preaching. If your right hand's your problem, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter like maim than to, than to go to hell with two hands. Now, again, uh, he doesn't mean that literally. We know it's an hyperbole. But what he's saying is that it's more serious to sin in certain ways than it is to lose your right hand or your eye or your foot. I mean, if I were to lose my right hand today, I'd hate to stay for the rest of my life. I, I, I love my right hand. I really like it, y'all. It's, it's very important to me. Uh, I was over playing the organ yesterday. Really, I, I like my right hand a great deal. 
If I were to lose it, this day would be the worst day of the rest of my life. I would hate it forever. But why don't I think that way about my sin? See, now I'm just trying to give you some biblical examples of how God sees in a way that we don't see, right? In a way that we don't see. We think our most serious problems is our health or our money or we don't have a big enough house or, you know, if only my spouse were better. God looks at us and sees, man, if you only understood. So he says to again, Faustina, let me quote it again. You see what you are of yourself, but don't be frightened. But if I were ever to reveal to you the whole misery that you are, you would die of terror. But as it is, because you are such a great misery, I reveal to you the whole ocean of my mercy. Now, he says later on in the diary, uh, few, not that far after, about maybe eight or nine paragraphs later, he says to this, my love and my mercy for you know no bounds. The graces that I grant are not for you alone, but for a great number of other souls as well. In fact, the greater the, 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 greater the sinner, the greater the right he has to my mercy. Did you hear that? He, he puts this as a right. It's an amazing text. He puts this as a right. He says, the greater the sinner, the greater the right they have to my mercy. So Jesus looks at us and he says, oh, if you could ever understand the full depths of your, of your, your how devastatingly, you know, tragically you, you are locked in confusion and sin. And it's not just sins of omission, commission, but it's sins of omission and so on. If you could ever, you, your, your head would explode. You couldn't take it. So out of my mercy, I don't let you see the full the full horror of your wound, but you come to me and I will pour forth my mercy and I'll, I'll go to work. I will go to work in this wound that frankly, you, if you really saw it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to take it. But I, I'm your divine physician and I love you and my mercy is a great, great gift to you. You see? So there's an old saying that if you don't know the bad news, the good news is no news. So we want to get in touch with this bad news. Our condition is much, much, much worse than we would ever think or imagine. Um, we often think, well, God, that other person over there needs mercy, but I'm, I'm, I'm basically in good shape. You know, this is how we can be if we're not careful. Um, no, no, not even close, y'all. So, so again, just, just see the bad news, but it's only a prelude to the good news. You've heard me say it to you this way before. You got it bad, and that ain't good. <laughs> but there's a doctor in the house, and his name is Jesus. And if you will let him into your heart, he will go to work in your life, and he will help you from the mess that you are and the mess you've made. See? But the, you got to start with the bad news. You got it bad, and that ain't good. Okay, now I want to read to you another thing. This is from the book now I mentioned to you earlier. Jesus, what Jesus saw from the cross. And it's a very powerful passage. Um, it's sort of similar to what I just read from Sister Faustina's diary. Uh, this would be about, if you have this book, um, it's on page 90 that I'm reading from, What Jesus Saw from the Cross. He says here, he, me he meditates. Jesus is the physician who heals our wounds, our ills, with his own pain. But the greatest pain of all is his vision, his diagnosis of our sin. He has a power of vision that is denied to us. Indeed, our own infirmity closes our eyes to the spectacle that meets his gaze. Jesus looks out and he sees the wickedness, the misery, and the injustice in this world, which is hidden from most of our eyes. If each one of us could see all the agonies and the atrocities and the injustices that fill the earth, we, would, we could not even live. If we could even see just our own sins face to face, we wouldn't dare look. We couldn't bear to look. It goes on to say on the next page, finally, multiply these sufferings, all that that Jesus saw from the cross on that day. Multiply these sufferings and then understand a, a terrible horror to add to it. His heart is stricken by his children's refusal to love him. His energy now exhausted. How then, how much further can the torments go for him? I think it was, was it Newman who wrote on the mental anguish of Christ? 
uh, it's, a, it's a worthy essay of reading, right? On the mental anguish of Christ. It wasn't just his physical sufferings, but I tell you, brothers and sisters, he saw our sufferings, he saw our sins, he saw our wounds, he sees everything in the whole world from the cross, and he bears all of it in a moment and carries it. Oh, the glory of his mercy for us, that he sees the awful, terrible condition of the human person and the whole human family stretching all through history. Every ignominy, every atrocity, every gulag, every genocide, everything came to his vision. And then also for us personally, every impure thought, every sorrow, every regret, all our greed, our struggles, was, you, know, you name it, he saw it all in that moment from the cross and agonized and poured forth his mercy. But it was his pain that, that, that became that mercy for us. You see the vision? Never forget the price of his mercy, the cost of it. That Jesus, seeing all of this, oh, how beautiful, how precious, how glorious, how necessary, how wonderful is his mercy, his mercy, his mercy. You see? Now, again, there's a lot of people today, again, who just sort of turn mercy into something completely different, like it's God's approval. It's not. It's just the opposite. He sees the terrible agony and personally experiences it in his own heart, on the cross, in his own mind, mental anguish. He sees it, and yet he says, have mercy, Father. Have mercy on them. I love them. I die for them, to heal them. So we never should make light of God's mercy and turn it into just sort of a bland approval. Likewise, another, I think, problem that we have today is that very frequently today, mercy is preached without any reference to repentance. You see. But you see, until you and I admit our need for mercy, which is what repentance ultimately is, how can we receive it? See, it's, it, repentance is kind of the key that unlocks the floodgates of mercy for us. We open the door, we say, Lord, I come to you. I admit, I don't even know the be. I don't even know a little bit of how awful my sins are. You know them. And I come before you repentant with humility and I kneel before you and I say, Lord, I need your mercy. I, I don't, I don't, my biggest sin is I don't even have a clue how much I really need your mercy. Oh, but thank you, Lord, for it. Thank you. Pour forth your mercy on me, Lord. And help me to begin to experience my need for it, but also to experience it so that having done that, I can begin to show mercy to others because I'm so relieved. I'm so grateful, so powerfully moved by your mercy for me. Remember, remember the, the parable of the man who owed 10,000 talents to a king. Now, 10,000 talents is like a trillion dollars. You're not going to work a little overtime, okay, to, get, to, to pay it off. He has a debt he cannot repay, and that's you and me. And the king just showed him mercy. He said, all right, I'll, I'll just forgive the whole debt. Just, I won't put you and your family in jail. I won't, no, no, I'll just I'll enslave you. Just, I'll forgive it. Just be, be on your way. Thank you. And he should have just been oh, overwhelmed. See? But something didn't happen. He didn't connect. Maybe because the debt was so big, he couldn't even imagine but there you see, then he went out and he found a dude that owed him 500 bucks. And he throttled him and threw him into jail until his family came up with the money. And the king found out and said, I can't believe it, man. I showed you such incredible mercy and it never touched you. You can't be in my kingdom until your heart's been touched by my need for mercy. He says, away with him, see? So again, we have to somehow ask the Lord. I mean, if you were ever to show us the full, like I said, it's a Faustina, the full horrible picture, we, we couldn't take it. But he shows us, but he does show us. And this is an opportunity for us to get on our knees in humility and say, Lord, the saints have told me, your scriptures have told me that I don't even know how much I need your mercy, but Lord, I am so grateful. And now help me to be forgiving and merciful to other people. Now, before I go on and, and uh, talk a little bit about the gospel today, I just want to um, say one more thing and then just maybe get some quick questions from you if there are a few. But before I do that, just one final thing to say that you notice that in our culture today, how 
Well, first of all, we're very selectively outraged, right? We'll, we'll, we'll tolerate 50 million abortions. You know, nah, you can't talk about that. But, you know, I don't know. Let's just pick some topics. And again, these are wrong things. So, for example, um, sexual abuse um, or just the, um, what do you call it, the, uh, the Me Too movement, the uh, sexual harassment and so on. So, and we ought to be outraged and angry about these sorts of things. But it, it's very selective. But we find that... There are people who, let's say 30, 40, 50 years ago, when they were you know, a stupid teenager in high school or college, did something and it comes to light, you know, hang them high, no forgiveness, you know, just away with them. You know, there's so little forgiveness in our culture when we're, you know, it's at least in those matters about which we're selectively outraged, right? Now, when I say selective outrage, please understand something. I am not saying that those things that we are outraged by, we shouldn't be deeply troubled by. But what I'm saying to you is that isn't it interesting how little forgiveness there is in our culture? Is that maybe because we've forgotten our need for mercy, our need for forgiveness, and we've forgotten our own condition, see? We may not have done this or that thing, but oh, if only the Lord were to show us just for a moment, we would die of fright, as he says, you know? Somewhere, somewhere, we're gonna be a very unforgiving culture until we can get back to the proper understanding of mercy, which isn't just, hey, God's like way cool with everything I do, man. That's not mercy. You don't need it if that's the case. It's because we're in terrible condition. He's not way cool. He sees what sin does to us and does to others. And because of that, he sheds his mercy and his grace upon us. And we should be incredibly grateful. All right, I'm going to do a little pause. Just a few questions. We can't have, I can't do, a, but I, I, I want to get on, I want to just sort of apply the gospel and then talk about judgment as Father asked me to do. So, Andy, do you want to help kind of help me? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, feel free if you want to submit things into the Q&A box and then also panelists. Yeah, Taylor, go go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask. The question I have about mercy, it sparked from your uh, your talk there. Is it repentance? Is it by God's grace or is it an act of our will or is it a combination of both? Where, where do we take part in that? And where is it that God's doing the work in us and then we have to respond? Yeah, you, know, you might expect this answer. It's both. It's, it's both our, our own um, sense of this but all, and our own decision, but also it is God's grace. It interacts, obviously, God interacts with our conscience, right? Now, although the conscience is ultimately an act of judgment, there's a sense of the conscience we call synderesis, which is that voice of God, those basic principles that he's put in our heart that, in, that, 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 that send up to our intellect a concern for something that we've done uh, that, might, be, you know, that, that, that uh, might well be wrong or sinful. And of course, then God also sheds graces upon us, calling us, summoning us to repentance. One um, of the more phenomenological um, descriptions of the conscience is that it is the voice of God echoing in our hearts. The catechism uses this expression. So again, God assists then what might be what we would call a natural um, understanding for a rational creature such as us who, who grasps through synderesis basic first principles. And then God adds his voice and perhaps then our guardian angel, as well as other graces who says, hey, uh, pay attention to what you just did there or didn't do there what you've omitted to do. And uh, this then makes us call to God. Other, one other final quick thing to say about repentance, and most of you have heard me on this before, if you've listened to me on these talks, repentance isn't just, doesn't just mean clean up your act morally. Repentance literally means to come to a new mind. Meta, change. Naus is the mind or the intellect. So to repent means to come to a new or a different way of thinking, right? Understand that, in ways that you haven't fully appreciated now that what you're doing is wrong and why it's wrong, and then change the way you act. And you've heard my litany before, many of you. So a thought, reap a deed. So a deed, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. So a character and reap a destiny. And it all really does begin in that real battleground, which is your mind, mm -hmm. your mind, where you, where you have thoughts and then you have deliberations on these thoughts and your will is engaged and then you make a decision and that's the real battleground. Satan wants in there. The world wants in there. Your flesh wants in there. And so does God. And that's why you got to pray and do a lot of scripture. Okay. So that's a maybe a longer answer than I meant to give Taylor, but that'd be my answer. Nice. Mary, I see you have your hand raised. Just one uh, quick thing. We'll take two more questions. Mary's got one. And then Amanda Parker just wrote in and then we'll 
um, yeah, we'll take it. Well, yeah, we'll move on. But uh, just uh, real quick, just want to plant this in your guys' mind. We will have a talk on the nature of conscience uh, in June. So if you want to kind of explore that theme a little bit, um, that's in our upcoming events section if you want to explore. Mary, go ahead. Hi, Monsignor. I was just wondering if you could comment briefly on balancing mercy with justice. Um, because, you know, on the most, like, reluctance to give forgiveness is where the talks on mercy generally flow from. But, like, for myself, it's the opposite issue of not being a doormat, you know, and injustice, um, where you call, at what, how do you determine where to draw the line and, and call mm -hmm people to responsibility. Yeah, I'm thinking that's particularly right now I'm dealing with this issue with my adult children. Yeah, it's all right. Well, uh, a couple of thoughts. First of all, I want to be careful to understand and distinguish. We have been talking about God's mercy, first and foremost. And to the degree that we can experience that, we can be more merciful. But as you say, it is not uh, unlimited. If we're human, and there are just going to have to be times when we have to say, look, enough. I have to draw a line here. You know, we, it's not possible for us, even if we'd like to, to live in peace with everybody. I can't give a complete discourse on that right now, but I will say that um, we want to make sure to understand that um, uh, we, we're mainly here speaking about our absolute need for God's mercy, God's mercy. And God is God, and he's unlimited, and he can show us a kind of a mercy and a patience uh, that others, you know, that we as human beings aren't always able, we should imitate, but we don't, we cannot have the same perfect mercy of God. We're imperfect. Now, secondly, though, how to relate God's justice and mercy? At one level, there will come a day of perfect justice, and that's our judgment day. Mercy and grace go away on that day, and we stand before God in perfect, it will be a day of perfect justice. Now, there is, though, in the meantime, a way that we can influence the measures and the standards that God will use to judge us in perfect justice. He says, for example, the measure that you measure to others will be measured back to you. Likewise, he says to us, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. He also says in the book of James, merciless is the judgment on the one who has shown no mercy. So meanwhile, we're, well, as long as we're here in this life, it's a time of grace and mercy that God grants us. But there does finally come a day when we stand before him. And God, it says in Romans 2, shows no partiality on that day. Perfect justice. But this part of that perfect justice is that he will measure back to us the measure that we've measured back to others. So Mary, you and I, I think the best we can do in situations where people um, uh, completely abuse and misuse us, um, we sometimes have to set up boundaries, right? Um, forgiveness in that case doesn't mean just I'm a doormat, let's pretend it never happened, do whatever you please to me. Forgiveness is ultimately this. You go to God and give it to him. Say, Lord, I'm so hurt, I'm so troubled, I can't solve this. I, I don't know what to do with this person. Every time I, I try to help them, I, I just it just gets worse. All I can do, Lord, is I can just give my hurt and my pain to you. And Lord, and the Lord will answer you back, Mary, and say, Mary, I know. And I, I, I saw everything, and I've seen everything that they've done. And I promise you, if they die in repentance, they will answer to me. Please, Mary, give it to me now. Don't be angry. Don't be bitter. You may have to keep boundaries with this person. But I ask you to let go of that vengeful anger where you want to see them hurt and repaid. Just give it to me now. I promise you they will speak to me about what I've done, or what, what, what they've done to you. I promise you. And just give it to God. So I think that's the best I can do now. But forgiveness doesn't mean to be a doormat. Neither does mercy, all right? That, that in a way, that's unmerciful. If you're a parent, you know this. If you don't insist that your kids are going to get up and go to school, well, not, not these days, but you know, uh, you know, that may not feel merciful to them, but it is merciful because it's saying, look, I want what's best for you, not just what pleases you, see? I'm not just here to give you whatever you want. I am here to give you what you truly need and to insist on what will really be a good, good for you. It, it, it wouldn't be mercy to give a person or to simply facilitate them in self-destructive or other destructive behaviors. That's not mercy. See, so I, I hope some of that helps, Mary, some of those distinctions. Okay, the other question, um, 
Yes, we'll take uh, this question from Amanda before hopping into the uh, today's gospel. So Amanda Parker writes in, how do you reconcile the fact that we can't know or fathom the depths of our sins or even remember them all, like you were saying, Monsignor, with Psalm 51, which is a beautiful request for mercy. But I always struggle with the verse, for I know my transgressions. So, so, so many times I don't always know or recognize my transgressions, but the psalm is still an aid in making an act of contrition and asking for mercy. How does this verse fit in? Well, okay, first of all, the word know, K-N-O-W in the Bible, we tend to think of know, that word to know, in intellectual terms today, um, as if I can comprehensively know something, you know, in all of its parts. But in the Bible, know is often more of an experiential concept. Um, it doesn't exclude intellectual knowing, but it's richer. So to say I know, it means I, I have deep, intimate, personal experience of my sins. To say that I know my sins. Um, that doesn't mean I fully experience them or know them. And as I said to you, you know, you don't want to take one verse of the Bible and make it the whole Bible, right? So, for example, uh, another text from the Bible from Jeremiah, more tortuous than all else is the human heart beyond remedy. Who can ever understand it? I alone, says the Lord, probe the mind and the heart. I alone see into the innermost parts of a man. So you see, or again, it says elsewhere, God's, we, man sees the appearance but God alone sees into the heart. So you don't want to take one Bible text and make it everything. You want to understand that the, yes, we know to some extent our sins, of course we do, um, but we don't know the full extent. And if we did, our heart would break. In fact, there are some who say, um, I think it's Garabandal, which is one of those apparitions that's on again, off again in terms of approval. But <clears throat> I do think that there's um, one of the prophecies is that there will come a day of three days of darkness during which every human being on the planet will have the full extent of their sin revealed to them. And it will be just, I mean, that's the real darkness. And uh, there will be kind of a combination of people who repent and run to the Lord and those who just despair, you know? Um, so again, that's a prophecy. I'm not saying it's in the Bible. I'm not saying it'll actually happen. But right now I know that from um, approved apparitions like the divine mercy, that uh, the Lord has said, if I were to ever really show you it, you, you would die of fright. So I think that we'll leave it at that. I think that what David is saying there is, look, I do know to some degree, and he knows what he did. He, he, he conspired to have a man murdered, and he committed adultery. And it's terrible. It was just horrifying from any point of view. And he goes before the Lord and says, I know. Man. You know I mean, talk about serious sin. So again, all of that's just a way of saying, but God showed him mercy. You know, that God, for, God had a heart for David. And you know what? I don't know if you've noticed, but in the Bible and the gospel, Jesus sort of liked sinners. He sort of hung out with a lot of them. <laughs> what he didn't like, and this, I, I, he loved them, but he didn't always like people who, who just said, I don't need mercy. I don't, I don't need your grace. I'm, I'm, I, pay, I pay tithes. I fast twice a week. You know, those are the folks that drove him crazy, right? <laughs> But he had a lot of fellowship with sinners. He kind of liked them. Aren't you glad? <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Bless the Lord. Um, let's move on to, um, I want to just say a few things about the gospel today. The way the gospel opens is you've got um, a group of frightened, scared, you know, frightened people, and they're huddled up in a room. Now, um, this would be, in this case, just the apostles. Later on for the Feast of Pentecost, there'd be 120 people in that room. But for now, you've got basically 10 men, because Thomas isn't even there for the first part of the gospel. Now, these men aren't just frightened. They are broken. They're troubled. Every one of them except John had fled. Um, and not only that, but they were disturbed. They were probably even a little angry at Jesus. You know, I thought he was the one. I thought, you know, he was going to come and deliver Israel. And then he just had this foolish plan to go to Jerusalem and die on some cross. And, and you, know, uh, you know, so they're frightened. They're angry. They're bitter. They're confused. But they're gathered. And I, I, I only paint this picture for you because I don't want you to underestimate. You imagine if you went through Good Friday. I'm not saying you didn't read about it in a book. You haven't grown up with it. You've never heard this before. You went through Good Friday like those guys did. How would you feel at the end of it? And there you are on a Sunday evening, huddled up in a room. The doors are locked because you're afraid of the Jewish authorities. 
you're angry, you're sorrowful, you're disappointed in yourself, you're devastated at what's happened, someone you knew and loved, you saw tortured to death, you thought he raised people from the dead. What's going on with my life? Three years of my life. I mean, you get the idea, right? Every human emotion, negative emotion, is in that room. See? And that's the prelude to mercy. This is how we can be. See? We can be very disappointed in ourselves. We can also be very angry with ourselves. We can also be very angry with God. We can also be very troubled and deeply confused and disturbed. I tell you, when this whole thing, when that, that, when that message came out that all public masses are suspended, it came like a boat out of the blue. And I tell you, I was shocked to the core, and it took me the better part of two weeks to recover emotionally. You know? I mean, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, this is kind of, I'm just trying to paint a picture for you, you know, of what happens. Something might happen in your life. You know, the phone rings and a beloved friend, a son, a daughter, maybe is dead suddenly. I, that happened twice in my life. The phone rang, my sister, she died in a fire. Charlie, come home. Your sister just died in a fire. My mother died in a snowstorm. It took us three days to find her body until the snow melted back. You know, that kind of stuff happens to us sometimes, you see. That's the kind of, I'm just trying to give you, except you've had things like that in your lives. And I can only tell you that I just want you to, I'm trying to set a prelude for you, all right? That's what this room was like. And now, into this room steps Jesus. And what does he do? You weren't there for me. Where were you when I needed you? No, none of that. He simply says to them, Shalom. Shalom, peace. Oh, the mercy. It says they were filled with joy, and he simply said it again, shalom. Now let's talk about shalom, because it's very related to mercy. In our modern American language, we tend to think peace, shalom, means that we're not fighting, we're not yelling at each other, we're not arguing. It's kind of like the absence of conflict. All right, so that's, that's just a negative, that's a negative definition of peace, right? But what is shalom really in the Hebrew? And also I'll give you the Greek root in a minute too, but in Hebrew, shalom means the presence in the relationship of everything that should be there, okay? That there is mutual love, respect, justice, reciprocity. There's a sense of just togetherness and oneness and wholeness. That's shalom. The Greek word is Irene, which uh, where we get the word the name, Irene, which means peace. You know, if your name is Irene, your name means peace. Uh, Irene, but Irene comes from the Greek word Iru, meaning to, uh, to, have all the, um, to have all the pieces together, to have all the parts. I mean, literally, it means the wholeness, so that everything that should be there is there. There's no missing pieces of the puzzle, so to speak. Do you, you follow me? See? So, in other words, shalom means now there is a wholeness. Whatever was missing is now filled in, is complete. Everything that should be here is here. Now, I, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus never said peace be to you or peace be with you until the resurrection. Uh, because why? Because there wasn't peace. We are, we, our hearts were separated from the Father who made us and loves us. You see, only through the open veil of his flesh did Christ open the way to the Father. Now, our way back to the heart of the Father is secured. And there is wholeness. There is peace. There is serenity. So what is Irene in, Irene in Greek? What is shalom? It is, a, it is a deep, stable, confident experience that everything that needs to be present is present. I feel whole, I feel complete, and the Lord offers this to us, you see. And our hearts are broken and tired and hard, and it's hard to fully receive the gift, but it's available. It is now available to you. So isn't this a beautiful scene of mercy that into this room with broken, frustrated, angry, 
devastated men who feel embarrassed, who felt like they let the Lord down, they let their families down, all they worked for for three years is gone and wasted, and God, Jesus, just steps there and he says, peace, shalom. What a beautiful mercy, a beautiful, beautiful mercy. See? I, I want to say that the very next thing is that having experienced this peace now, you notice I said he's 10 because Thomas is absent. We'll get to him in a minute. But he then says, he then breathes on them and says, receive now the Holy Spirit. This is not for confirmation. That'll come later at Pentecost. There's a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit to these 10 apostles, these 10 priests. He says, now he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. And whose sins you retain, they are retained. So he doesn't just give them some ability to go out and announce mercy, but there's a kind of a juridical power, if I could put it this way. They are given the grace to both bestow mercy or forgiveness, or at, in rare times to withhold it. If for some reason they perceive that a person isn't really repentant and so on, isn't really ready to step away from that sin, all right? So there's a juridical power, right? It isn't just go out and tell everybody God loves you. You know, you know, anybody could do that. But he, he actually bestows upon them a priestly power to forgive sin. He didn't want our experience of his mercy to just depend on some self-generated subjective, I think God's forgiven me. I feel forgiven. You know, and, and that's too vague. He, he wanted his mercy, which was so important, to, be, to also be, depend, at least in more serious matters, those beautiful words of the priest in a confessional. And by the way, I heard confessions all morning long before I came here. Just dozens of confessions. People came by the church today. God bless every one of them. They were here when I opened the door at seven in the morning. They were in line coming in to hear confessions today on Divine Mercy Sunday. Um, and I could say those beautiful words to them. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's something objective there, you see. And it isn't Charles Pope. That's Jesus speaking. I'm just the mule he rides on. I'm just the ventr I'm just the dummy in the ventriloquist act, okay? I mean, I'm kidding with you, but I mean, he takes up the, the humanity of the human priest, but it's Jesus who speaks those words. Jesus did not want something so important as his mercy to just simply depend on some self-generated, you know, uh, subjective feeling. I think I'm forgiven. I feel that he's forgiven me. He wanted it to depend on that objective interaction that we call the sacrament of holy confession, okay? So that's, I, I want to emphasize that. Now, there was one missing that day, uh, Thomas. And even though he heard the testimony of the church, now remember, Thomas had seen Jesus raise people from the dead, work countless miracles, walk on the water, calm storms. And when the church comes to him and says, we have seen the Lord, he still disbelieves. That is a sin against faith. Because the church is an object of faith. And when the church says Jesus has risen from the dead, if you're a person of faith, you have an obligation to believe that. You know, we say that in the creed, right? I believe in one God, and then he's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. You're not believing in a human institution. You're believing in the body of Christ, see? Now, when the church can no longer say we have seen the Lord, we will no longer be the church. But we do. Every generation, we have said to the world, we have seen the Lord. He's alive. And here's what he said to us. And here, here are the saving truths for our salvation. We have not just seen him. We've heard from him. We've experienced his presence. We receive him in the sacraments. And we speak of, you, we speak of him to you, the world. That's the church. That's the body of Christ. He's still in the world, still speaking, still loving, still touching, still laying hands on people, still feeding. Okay, now, so that's why I mean when I say the church is an object of faith. But Thomas says, uh-uh, got to have it on my own terms. And Jesus even here says, Thomas, I'm going to show you some mercy. <laughs> he does and say, Thomas, you know, you only believe because you saw me for yourself, but blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. And that's us. Thank the Lord. He gives a bit. But he's so merciful again to Thomas. That's all I want to say. I don't know who got to Thomas. He excluded himself from the church for a brief minute, and he missed the Lord. As we say in the African-American church, he blocked his blessings, y'all. He was blocking his blessings. So, you know, you step away from the church and the sacraments, you block your blessings. 
But thanks be to God, somebody got to Thomas and the following week he was there. And the Lord was so good to him, so merciful. Thomas, come. You really need this? Come. Have that touch. Feel. See for yourself. But Thomas, you're getting a privilege that most people won't get. How blessed are those who still hear the testimony that I speak through my body, the church. See? And that's a blessing for every one of us. Okay? So that's a little bit on the gospel. Now, a final thought, though, that I, I want to bring to your attention. I, I hadn't thought to do this, but I think, you know, it gets back a little bit married to what you're talking about, too. Um, God's mercy doesn't mean that God is some pushover, or that nothing in the main matters, and in the end, everybody just goes straight to heaven. So I, I, I did want to speak to you a little bit about God's mercy and how it relates to the possibility that there are some, maybe even as Jesus says, many, whatever he means by that term, many in hell. How does this relate? I want to read from Sister Faustina, first of all, from her diary. All right, I'm reading from uh, her diary here. I, I have to look up the exact paragraph. It's at the bottom of the page. I'll give that to you in a minute. But here is what Faustina herself writes. Remember, she's the great agent of divine mercy. And she says this. Today, I was led by an angel into the chasms of hell. It is a place of great torture. How awesome and large and extensive it is. These are the kinds of tortures I saw. The first torture that constitutes hell was the loss of God. The second is perpetual remorse of conscience. The third is one's that, the realization that one's condition will never change. I can't start loving what I never loved, in other words, right? The fourth is that the fire will penetrate the soul without destroying it. Um, it goes on to say here, um, there was in, in this place a continual darkness, a terrible suffocating smell. The sixth torture is the constant company of Satan. <laughs> As one who's been in exorcism, I want to tell you how tedious demons are. The most tedious creatures you'll ever meet are demons. All right, sorry, but I digress. Um, reading on. Um, uh, the seventh torture is the despair and hatred of God. Um, uh, and curses and blasphemies. Um, and goes on to say there are certain special tortures that particular souls also endure. I, I won't read the whole thing, but she goes on to say, and she says this, I'm writing this at the command of God so that no soul may find excuse in saying there is no hell or that nobody's ever been there or gone there. Um, I, Sister Faustina, by the order of God, have visited the abyss of hell so that I might tell souls about it and testify to its existence. I cannot fully speak about it now, but I have received a command from God to leave it in writing. The devils were full of hatred for me and for you, uh, but they had to. Uh, but ultimately, they had to obey me at the command of God. What I have written is but a pale shadow of the things that I saw. But I noticed one thing: that most of the souls in hell that were there had disbelieved that there was a hell or that anyone went there. First of all, let me give you that paragraph. I, I have it here now. Um, for example, so this would be um, uh, the diary. Uh, number 965, I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, n number 741, I'm, I, I read the wrong footnote here, number 741 in her diary, you'll, you'll find what I read there, okay? Number 741. Now, what, what I want to say here is that, uh, let's go to the end and I'll work my way backward and build this case, and I got to do it in all of about, you know, four or five minutes. One of the saddest truths about the souls in hell is that they would be more miserable in heaven. And that's a very sad truth. See, one of the problems is that most of us have conceived of heaven as a personal designer paradise. You know, what I want heaven to be will be, it'll be, da, 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 it'll be this and this and this. That's not what heaven is. What heaven is, is the fullness of God's kingdom with all of its values. See, now the question is, do you want what God is offering or not? Now, some of the things that God is offering, people show that they do not want. For example, love of your enemy, forgiveness, chastity, generosity as opposed to greed. Um, God is at the center, not me. Worship as the chief and most joyful thing about heaven rather than, I don't know, playing golf or something else. Now, do you understand what I'm trying to show you is that there are some people who say, I don't want to love my enemy. I want to kill my enemy. I want to, I want to watch and see sweet revenge. Or uh, I don't want to live chase. Are you kidding? 
what, what, what a stupid thing. Why would I want to be chased? You know, and so on. What I'm trying to show you is that God will not force anyone to love what he loves or who he loves. Right? Now, you remember the story of the prodigal son? Let's go to the second son, though. We all know about the first son. The second son hears there's a party going on, and the father comes out, and please, come into the party. Your brother was lost, and he's found. He's come back home. I don't want to go in there as long as he's in there. That rotten, stinking brother of mine. No, no way. I don't want to go in there. I, I don't want your, I, I have nothing to do with your party. I don't want what you want. So, and then the story ends. That's an image of heaven. You see, what if you were to look into heaven and see people that you don't love in there? You've heard my story, some of you. There was a woman in one of my parishes early on, and she, she was concerned that our parish was changing, and these, quote, black people were moving into the parish. And she finally said to me, Father, I just don't like black people. I'm afraid of them. And I said, okay, well, I said, unfortunately, you will be very unhappy in heaven. She said, oh, no, no, I'll be very happy in heaven because I love Jesus and Mary, and I pray the rosary every day. I said, no, no, you're going to be miserable. What are you talking about, Father? I, I come every day to Mass. What are you talking about? There are black people in heaven. Now, she got so angry with me that she didn't speak to me for like two weeks. But to her credit, she ultimately repented and she became um, a, a great tutor in our school, 98% African-American children. She helped a lot of them get a foothold and, and get good grades and head on to college. And she had a great transformation. But you see, what I'm saying is that you, if you, you, you're, God is not going to force you to love the heaven that is his kingdom. So the real drama for you and me right now is, are you and I going to begin to desire the things that God is actually offering or just selfishly cling to our own personal view of what's good for us? So you see, there's a certain mercy in this. And I'll wrap up now if I get some questions. Um that God will not force you to love what he loves or who he loves. And that's part of his mercy. You know, he's not simply going to you know, force you to do something. And the saddest truth of all, the saddest truth is ultimately on judgment day, our hearts will be forever fixed. And we're not going to change after that. And there comes that day when God says, okay, here's what I'm offering. I don't want it. I, I, I don't want the alternative, but I don't want that even more. And God said, well, you can consider yourself dismissed. I won't force you. I won't force you to love me or who I love or what I love. I've always been calling to your name, but I won't force it. So you see how for ultimately for God, mercy and justice are alike, aren't they? Right? So this idea um, is that uh, God's, the idea that there's a hell and that people go there and marry the point you were making earlier, and some people ask me this, God tells us we have to forgive, but there's some people he never forgives. That's not true. God still loves the souls in hell, but they've just come to a point where I will not be told what to do or what to like or who to like. And the only sin that God really can't forgive is that kind of clenched fist and I will not be told what to do attitude. And God says, well, I've been offering this to you all your life and calling you and you've just kept saying no and now your no is a permanent no and I'm so sorry you don't want what I'm offering. You can consider yourself dismissed. Um, and they go to live in a separate place. It's not pleasant, but the truth, the saddest, saddest truth of all is that the souls in hell would be even more miserable in heaven. They could not tolerate the beauty. They could not tolerate the justice, the chastity, the magnificence of God's glory and beauty and light. It's just be too much for them. And so they live in darkness, away from God. Not happy, but even aware that they would be even unhappier nearby the kingdom. All right, we'll, we'll have to leave it at that. But again, it, don't separate out the idea of God's mercy from his justice. Ultimately, they come together in that moment when he says, I really do respect your freedom. I really do. And your decision, I now accept. And either come to the kingdom I prepared for you or not. Great. Thank you so much, Monsignor. We'll take a couple questions just at the end here real quick. Uh, Therese Gibson wrote in uh, wondering if there's a recommendation for a particular examination of conscience. I'm just going to point you, Therese, uh, to a talk in our library called Preparing Our Hearts, Preparing Our Hearts, mm -hmm. the guided examination. And then also if you search... Um, probably conscience or if you just search the talks given by monsignor pope he, he has given a talk on this subject as well kathy mm -hmm. flowers writes in and asks is it a sin to believe that jesus 
has forgiven our sin through confession, but we have not been able to forgive ourselves. Well, if what you're talking about is a feeling, maybe not. Um, I do think, though, that we do have to at least intellectually accept that um, once having heard those words from a validly ordained priest, I absolve you, then we have to say those sins are forgiven. How we emotionally feel <clears throat> about ourselves and our emotional recovery may be something that's a little bit, takes a little longer. And we should probably go to God and say, Lord, help me to really trust those words and to begin to live out of a new dignity now that I know you gave me, but I don't feel I have. And uh, I'm still angry and disappointed in myself. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a, a, a sin unless we cling to it. But we all know that our emotions often tag along a little behind our thoughts, our reason. Mm -hmm. uh, Monsignor, would it be possible to receive a blessing from you? We'll conclude with that. Yes, may the peace and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you always. Amen. And for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world, O oh Lord. Amen.